All right, here we are on the first guest episode of whatever this show is called now. I think we're still going with let's see what we got this week, but I'll probably wind up calling it something else as I have more guests. Uh, tonight we have on Astrid, and I've known Astrid for quite some time now. We are philosophy buddies in a lot of ways and have had many conversations, including what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, the main topic is going to be on George's b- Bataille. Not sure if that's pronounced correctly. I'm sure I'll be uh, told how to say that correctly soon. But uh, yeah, Astrid, why don't you go ahead and say hello and uh, tell everyone a little bit about what some of your main areas of interest are and how you got into the, uh, the current author. All right, thank you. Um, I don't know. I think uh, going back, I, I'm I've read a lot of the books. I'm fairly familiar with them. I think my uh, my deepest introduction. Um, I mean, of course, everyone hears about the the classic uh, story of the eye, um, which is just uh, some kind of a uh, freaky erotica novel that Bataille wrote under the name Lord Osh, um, and that's you know, just pretty freaky erotica type stuff uh, in the early 20th century, you know, a bunch of na- nasty French stuff. Um, so that's like, that's, you know, if he was a popular artist, that would be his like hit single, you know, that everyone knows him for. Um, I mean, I've read it like once, which is, um, cause I actually encountered that book in the wild. So I was like, okay, I'm going to pick it up and read it. And then I did. And then I haven't really come back to it um, only cause that's like, you know, I want to find the deep cuts um you know so there was that and then there's uh just as you kind of get into the work um he writes a lot about transgression and uh kind of this going beyond what you you think you're capable of and and really the uh the dirty kind of disgustingness of the world and he, he doesn't shy away from that um that's you know kind of one of the big themes ever, everyone kind of you know like the, the the common joke is that he's like he like a lot of the writings are very like sexual and dirty. He writes a lot about death, eroticism, uh, shit. Um, there's this great documentary that's autobiographical about him called Aperitive View. Um, I think I sent you a link to that if you want to check it out sometime. Okay. And there's this, uh, yeah, um, it was the other day when we were talking. There's this line in it where it says. Uh, the narrator of the documentary says that I was an obsessive who saw only the most, you know, vile, disgusting, you know, dark parts of life, um, which, of course, is interesting. I don't know if that's an exact quotation. I have like a, a post. I'll post screenshots of from that, uh, from that documentary from time to time. So that's that's an interesting that's kind of what drew me to it, because it's like, you know, someone not afraid to look at the more disgusting and, you know, taboo uh parts of philosophy which i feel like um at least in putting it in the context of like philosophy as a whole and this is something i've kind of been thinking about a lot like going back to ancient greece even like philosophy was like searching out the good and the beautiful and you know all these like uh values or if you know if you want to like fast forward to like modern philosophers you had you know uh this age of reason uh with the enlightenment and you had uh you know, Kant wanting to categorize things and stuff like that. And something about Bataille is really that um, he talks about the failure of reason a lot. Um, And this isn't necessarily like something I like pets to talk about. I just know it's like a general theme. We can kind of get a little bit more into it later. But that was something that like spoke to me too, like a philosopher who is willing to like write at length, like book length about different things, but not necessarily rely on like, very deep, heavy, like, you know, uh, categorical or very, like, clean, compartmentalized ways of doing things. Um, and he also wrote uh, wrote literature, wrote books and, and things, and was friends with uh, artists. Um, Pierre Klosowski um, also was involved with the Asafal Society, which is this... Uh, secret society at the time and Pierre Klosowski was also uh, probably the most influential 
translator of Nietzsche into French in the early 20th century. Um, okay. so that was actually my introduction. So circling it back, maybe to sum up like a short little introduction, like that's well, that and more. So, hold on one, one sec. Let's, let's, uh, so what are some of the other topics that you're interested in besides the tie? And then we'll, we'll jump oh, in. Let's create a little bit oh, of a context. Uh, for why sure, we're talking for sure. about them. Um, so that's how I got into it. Um, I know you and I kind of both know each other through like anarchy type stuff. Um, and I think that's definitely an interesting frame. We could think about how these ideas can, can be applied in a liberatory way, um, or in a way that, you know, allows you to kind of reclaim the existence you want. Um, so I, I like, I guess I do like a lot of like French theory type stuff, like, uh, you know, also, you know, I guess I could, I could find something interesting in most philosophy type stuff, even if it's like the most dry, you know, analytic Anglo-American philosophy, um, which is where I, you know, what I studied in university. Um, so I, I can find it interesting stuff there all over the place. Um, recently, I've been reading uh, Julie Kristeva's book, uh, Powers of Horror, an, an essay on objection, which is influenced um, by Bataille. She mentions that in there, this idea of like the abject. So that's something that we can uh, okay. talk about. Or, or, or I mean, I, I don't have it in front of me. So maybe not talk about it directly, but maybe tangentially. Um, yeah, I definitely do have found a home, I, guess, I suppose, in the, uh, the French um, kind of theory tradition. And I guess specifically, like, the way uh, the French, like, interpreted uh, a lot of them, I, we would say Bataille um, has a book on Nietzsche. Uh, Gilles Deleuze has a book on Nietzsche as well. So I think yeah. um, something about that is uh, really spoke to me. And, of course, I'm a, a big Deleuze and Gattari fan, I guess, you know. And it sounds uh, like and, also and, and, a big Nietzsche fan. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just haven't read as many like primary texts by Nietzsche. It's just something that's kind of always haunted me, hmm. you know. Like I'll I'll get around to it eventually. It's just uh, and I, I suppose like that would be a, that's, that that was my way of compartmentalizing it. I suppose I was like I'm interested in these authors and like oh what a surprise, you know. Here's all their callbacks to Nietzsche and stuff. Um, so so given what you've already said. Um, we know that uh, this was that he was somewhat responding to the German idealists because you mentioned Kant, and also responding to Nietzsche if he wrote about Nietzsche. So, what is the time period that Bataille was most active in? Um, I'd say in the early 20th century. Uh, I think he died in '62, or maybe um, that's when his last book was published definitely alive in France through World War II. And we could talk about that um, in the book Blue of Noon if we want, which is a novel that I've uh, read a couple times. Um, or novella, it's pretty short. Mm -hmm. So definitely early 20th century France. And uh, there's a you know whole intellectual tradition um, there. And uh, Michel Foucault was also uh, influenced by Bataille. And... Uh, Posowski, um, my copy of Posowski's Le uh has a foreword written by Michel Foucault. Um, I feel like Foucault's like, uh, um, I don't know if he's dedicated or, or written certain, I, I feel like he's dedicated uh, certain works to Bataille. Maybe I've read some essays or something like that. I but, do recall, um, definitely, I recall seeing some references for sure in Foucault. Yeah, absolutely. And even like, Going forward, Jean-François Lyotard has mm -hmm. uh, a libidinal economy, depends a lot on Bataille. Um, probably just be, I'm, I'm trying to think, like, I don't want to, I guess I can speculate, like, you know, him as a philosopher, like, willing to get messy and in the muck and, you know, uh, talk about death and confront death and, and confront taboos in, in different ways that are not necessarily structured in any tradition outside of his own or like a specifically Bataille type tradition. Um, 
which you could say is an extension of like a sort of Nietzschean tradition, but that it's very specific. It's not like, you know, people talking about sexuality or death or, or things like that in like the psychoanalytic tradition or, or in some other type of uh, philosophical way or like a sociological tradition, which I think Bataille kind of uh, does dabble in, in some of his works do feel kind of historical and sociological. I think that was a big uh, interest of his as well. Um, and even going forward, just uh, I know some work from Tikkun referenced Bataille and some of his ideas if we're gonna fast forward to the late 20th century when the Tikkun journals came out, which is something I'm also really interested in. So, so um, well, so let's talk a little bit about uh, when he was still alive and what was going on in France at the time. And maybe, you know, you mentioned the uh, Asaph, what is it called? The Asaphatil Society? Yeah, the Asaphatil uh, Society, uh, just real quick, there's probably better summaries out there. It's the society he made with some other intellectuals at the time, Andre, uh, Andre Mazan, who did the Asaphatil symbol. Um, of like a headless man. Yeah, the famous, yeah, that you see on all the cool places. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think that was Edward Mazan's artwork. And, uh, um, yeah, yeah. I'd actually have a, this book called the Encyclopedia Acephalica that has a bunch of uh, stuff from that. And my understanding of, uh, okay, so just real quick to get it out of the way, um, you know, the, the thing that everyone loves to speak about on the internet is that like, you know, they, they were very secretive and were supposedly like, you know, willing to set human sacrifice each other. And everyone was, uh, everyone in the group was willing to be the sacrificee and have their head cut off in some sort of like, uh, ritual type thing, but no one wanted to volunteer to do it. Um, <laughs> okay. That's the whole kind of, uh. The funny thing about it uh, that's that's the whole that's like the story that's told i don't know how accurate it is but that's the one that gets repeated and um and the theme of headlessness i think is also very important and also called symbol um which we can kind of go into a little bit deeper uh is like the, well, like the that that theme crops up quite a bit throughout his work um outside of uh just like specific text talking about that and talking about the, uh, that group of people. And just to, just to wrap it up, it's my understanding that that journal uh, propped up at the time, probably in the, I want to say in the 30s, um, as a sort of way for the French Nietzscheans to reclaim the Nietzschean tradition from uh, the Nazis that were, you know, horribly misinterpreting Nietzsche um, at the time. And was there any connection between them and the Dadaists, uh, which is kind of bumping into similar time periods? Um, I don't know if they interacted that much. Um, I know they interacted with the Surrealists. Um, Bataille has worked about uh, some Dali paintings, and then there was, uh, he knew Andre Breton, who's a popular surrealist, but he, yeah. I think they had a falling out or they were, uh, they had some philosophical disagreements that led them to not be, be friends. So I think <laughs> the data were, as, to my knowledge, a bit earlier and right. maybe just not, not in the same country. No, um, that's not to say, some, yeah. Uh, some of those ideas didn't, uh, um, you know, yeah, because over or because if he's contemporary with the surrealists, then uh, yeah, I'm just curious what some of his major influences would be. I know there's a lot of, you know, from what I've researched on my own, which isn't a lot. Um, I know there's a lot of esoteric Gnostic influences, but outside of that, I don't really know what his philosophical inspirations are besides Nietzsche. I mean, I would say Nietzsche and uh, Marquis de Sade. I would say that's like that's who he's the child of. Um, outside of that, a lot of the other people he he discusses uh, are also just contemporaries. Um, I know uh, Roger Calois. He talks about a lot. He's also influenced by a lot of like sociologists. Um, 
he responds to some Freud stuff. He does, yeah, actually, as far as, like, a lot of his writing, having gone through my notes and, and some of his books, um, he does write a lot about his contemporaries. He, he'll talk about Sartre in the Literature and Evil book. Um, and I, from what I understand, he has not such a high opinion as Sartre, right? I mean, I think there are, there, there are absolutely philosophical disagreements, but... I, I don't know. I couldn't point to a spot in the text at this time about what uh, what he felt at the time. I mean, he was kind of on his own. He was on his own tip, basically. Hmm. So, okay. um, I like I couldn't point to a, a specific disagreement like right now. Um, That's all right. Yeah, I specifically looked for you know Sartre and Bataille connections, and I came across some very very. Uh, scant references so and mostly on uh, the side of Sartre that's what I was reading so didn't get a whole lot out of my search on that but um yeah I think I mean they were around at the same time so I definitely think that there was like that but like I said now that I'm thinking about it but I wrote a lot and cites a lot from his uh contemporaries um interesting so yeah I'd say as far as like influences um and i guess that would just be philosophical influences uh yeah we'll call it we'll call it philosophical influences would be you know Desaad and nietzsche um and then you know he has a bunch of literary influences too he has this whole book uh literature and evil which uh discusses um just a bunch of different authors just to go through, he discusses Emily Bronte, Baudelaire, Michelet, William Blake, uh, Desaad, Proust, Kafka, and Jean Genet. So that's, that was just the, uh, all the authors he addresses in the literature and evil book. So I think he's also influenced by that as well. Um, and like historical stuff, but I'd, I'd say if we're to boil it down philosophically, um, he kind of just ran with, uh, whatever he was doing. Also, he was, uh, to get some other basics out of the way, he was a, like a medieval librarian and he almost joined the seminary like uh, as a kid and decided that wasn't for him. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's a very interesting stuff around uh, his, uh, his background, which uh, that, that video, it's just on YouTube. It's easy to, to find. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll link to it. I'll link okay. to it in the description or put a card in or something. Right. The biggest thing that um, revealed to me, which I ended up discovering at like 3 a.m. one day uh, and watched the whole thing at that time, which is prime time to watch it if you, you know, have a bunch of time on your hands, was that his, uh, his father was blind when he was growing up. So his father never kept any lights on in the house. Oh, and I thought shit. that was really interesting because, uh, you know, his like the night, darkness, death, uh, different things like that um, are, are definitely themes that, that drew me to this work. So, yeah, I mean, I would, if there was anybody that, you know, anybody into the goth or death rock uh, music scenes read, I would assume it would be the tie. Uh, yeah, I think, I feel like, you know, even like, uh, yeah, definitely like, that that crowd or people you know in the proto-industrial or early uh that type of stuff you know i'm sure like psychic tv and like throbbing Gristle were all into that stuff too, yeah you know i, I think that was honestly it's like as far as like people i know through the internet i think that's a that was a big uh kind of a inroad for them you know learning about uh you know bataille and the sod and and that yeah kind of i mean stuff. so outside of me Sorry, I was just like my ex my exposure was like just purely academic. Like you know, you look up lineages of philosophers and you hear these stories about oh yeah, he wrote this like really disgusting erotica book called Story of the Eye and and so on. Yeah. And then you get deeper into it and you're like, wow, these are actually a lot of interesting ideas. I appreciate. Uh, so tying him into Desaad, what? Besides the erotica, because that's what the, the sod is really most well known for in the popular imagination. But the sod is a philosopher 
was a very strong naturalist uh, is how I would categorize him. Where if you read a dialogue between a priest and a dying man, you get this uh, basically a, a very naturalistic metaphysics, but the but nature is not described um, as something benign. Uh, Desaad is quite willing to to cover the uh, the gruesome aspects of nature. At least that's what I've taken out of Desaad. But not being very familiar with the tie, what, where are some of the agreements and disagreements there? And if I have paraphrased or summarized the side in a way that doesn't make a lot of sense, go ahead and yeah, let me know that. Oh, for sure. Um, well, like, sorry, just deciding. I'm flipping through this chapter in Visions of Access, which is the big pink book that I selected writing 1927, 1939. And he has a chapter called The Youth Value of uh, Desaad, an open letter to my comrades. Like, the theme of just, like, shit. Um, like, there's a bold, uh, all caps, I'm just staring at the page, and it says excretion. Um, which is also another theme in Bataille, this idea of like uh, shit, excretion, things that are left over, uh, things that like have no use value, which we could talk about in, in our curse share, or, or like the leftovers yeah. of things. Um, uh, also like, uh, like kind of the political implications of like what uh, the sod was about, like, like, looking back on what the sod was and this uh um and, and what happened with all that uh, as far as the what, french that, revolution and the terror and everything yeah, yeah exactly and i think that's definitely something that um but i take seriously as far as like poli like politics and like being willing to look at you know uh i don't know what comes after revolution or like taking absolutely the bad with whatever else is happening, you know. Um, right, and, and Saad's big thing about the French Revolution, from what, I under, from what I remember, is that the French state, the Republic, uh, he wasn't able to see any legitimate justification for um, capital punishment, right, was mm -hmm. one of the things that really pissed off the Saad because if he got rid of God as being the the uh, lawgiver and your republic is supposed to be founded on you know what is natural and human, then you kind of have to accept murder as a right for everyone was I believe one of the things Saad was saying uh, during his time. Okay, yeah, that definitely tracks with uh, um what Bataille would, would probably say, I, I don't like, without, you know, explicitly rereading the chapters and kind of going through it. Cause like, just, just to be clear, like his, uh, his work, his philosophy and theory that he's writing is, it's very literary and he definitely like expresses himself in, in that manner. But there, it's not to say that there aren't, you know, very definitive arguments and I just don't want to misspeak to them or, or, uh, yeah, let's not let's summarize them properly. Let's just get that out of the way. So, like, what percentage, you know, let's, for lack of a better term that comes to mind, if you were to say Bataille wrote from a detached viewpoint versus a literary or really, uh, I guess, effective with an A, affective mm -hmm. viewpoint. What would you say that ratio was like? Oh, he was absolutely it in uh, most of his books. I guess um, I would say most notably inner experience. You know, there's like uh, great lines where he he like interjects in the book that he's like struggling writing the current book or like um, I'm pretty sure it's inner experience where he's like anytime I take up a project, I, you know, can't. I struggle to finish it, but the only thing that's pushing me forward is, 
you know, I fear death and the void. So I just push on through. Um, so he's definitely in that. And, uh, um, I think the most attached he is, is would be in, uh, the Accursed Shares volume one through three, because that's, that's kind of just attaching, you know, uh, quite a bit of like human influence, uh, on, you know, the, the material world or how things work. It's, it's, so those are the two books about, um, the general economy and this idea of expenditure. Right. Really things that, you know, you don't need to be a human to understand this. It's kind of like this, like, I would say like an inhuman economy, like what does the inhuman economy look like of like, uh, excesses and expenditures you know like plants Let's, create fruit as excess because they have energy from the sun you know or yeah know. let's and let's let's uh continue on talking about the affairs to share for a little bit i actually just got them in the mail which they've been on my reading list probably like seven or eight years now and i'm positive you're the one who recommended it to me that's how long it's finally taken me to oh right, right. to get them uh, cause my head's up my own ass most of the time. <laughs> hey, that's, a, that's a, which that's might a be a bit high again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so obviously I haven't read this, this work yet, but from, uh, the premise seems to be just what you were saying that there is an excess, right? There is a, there's a consistently produced uh, unwanted or cursed or excessive share of what would you say libido or life force or how would the time? Yeah, and it, to an extent, I'll just read this part um, from the beginning just because I happen to open a page. Um, just a couple things, just so we can know where we're start, like where this starts, right? So. This is from A Cursed Share, Volume 1. He says, solar energy is the source of life's exuberant development. And then on, on the next page, he says, solar radiation results in the, a superabundance of energy on the surface of the globe. Um, later, he says, it then radiates or squanders it, but before devoting an appreciable share to this radiation, it makes maximum use for, of, it, of it for growth. Only the impossibility of continuing growth makes way for squander. So he takes this idea that of squandering of that, just at its base level, you know, this giant nuclear reaction in space, you know, is projecting all this energy and like all life, I guess you would say life, um, all things on earth, like can't use up all of it. And so then he ties that and goes through, you know, okay, what are the, you know, sociological, historical implications of that, political implications of that. Um, I haven't finished, I don't think I've finished volumes two and three, but um, then how that uh, interacts with desire and like kind of personal relations. Yeah, I think the first volume is like more so sociological. Um, that's where you get his, his, you know, writings about human sacrifice and, and whatever. And then I think the next well, let me uh, pause you right there because yeah, yeah, yeah. So, to me, when I hear that, it reminds me of Leotard talking about libidinal economy and things like that. Is that a connection that's explicit that you know of, or is this two different ideas that go in very different directions? Or? Um, I'd say Leotard was definitely influenced by. Uh, George Bataille, at like absolutely probably more so than uh, anybody anybody else. So I think that's like I'm trying to remember. Like, I don't know where my copy of Little Bit No Economy is. Probably within hand's reach. I don't don't see it on top. Yeah, um, I, I got it somewhere too, actually. But, but yeah, um, that, that totally tracks to me. So I think that's an extension of the like. I mean, if you think Bataille's general economy, you know applying you know solar radiation to life and the libidinal economy it's not a far jump well this is sort of it's also somewhat psychoanalytic in the freudian sense right because 
you know, the whole idea of catharsis being a method of dealing with uh, excess libido in Freud sounds like it would track with this uh, broader picture that describes sort of the bubbling up of not libido, but what would precede it in other entities that are uh, don't know what to do with this excess of something. Yeah, yeah. This, I, I think he just calls it energy, or he do, doesn't necessarily even talk about the where the excess comes from, but just the fact that there is an excess and what's done with that. Um, so, and it's not only on a personal level, like a lot of the accursed share uh, is on a, a societal level. So he'll, he'll talk about, you know, and his whatever type of, you know, problematic anthropology is going on aside. Uh, a big argument coming out of this is like the fact that certain cultures went to war was because there was, extra energy you know things were going too well you know and then uh at the same time there was also cultures who had human sacrifice and that was a way to deal with uh extra energy and whether it was like uh, uh to deal with the excess of society you know like and not not just a few cultures right that was like a very common yeah yeah so he goes he goes through a lot of that in the uh, accursed chair and, uh, you know, this idea of sacrifice and, uh, but not just as sacrifice is like a material thing, but also as like a spiritual and, uh, kind of, you know, mystical thing, um, is also a, a theme that goes through a lot of his, his work. Um, uh, So what is the problem there if uh, a species doesn't sacrifice or just doesn't come up with some sort of reliable technique for dealing with this excess? Um, well, then the, I, I think you would say that the violence uh, bubbles up in other forms, you know, and I think this would be a way of like, he's looking at these, these cultures and saying, look at this culture was able to thrive because they had human sacrifice. Um, or these cultures could be peaceful because they didn't have to go to war because they had, uh, you know, sacrificial rites that they did. Or, or I guess we could, you know, a kind of a just craft brief way of saying it, like, maybe that's like looking at the 20th century, like, oh, my gosh, or is the world too filled with all this excess energy that that's why the world wars happened or something like that, you know, Um there's always a leftover of energy that has to go somewhere. And I think this would also be a tie into like libidinal economics, like, or even psychoanalysis, like where does our excess drives, excess uh, libidinal investment go into, you know? And I think um, a lot of people in psychoanalysis would say, you know, when we have that, it, it turns back in on ourselves and becomes destructive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Bataille is kind of looking for the, the, the valve to, to let this off and that's um because i would say like like i i've thought about like what would to boil it down what would a bataille like bataille's metaphysics look like and it's it's difficult i don't know if i could ever come up with a summary but like i definitely think this idea of excess um is important to think about even metaphysically and i think that's why it's to a large extent it's like the first place people go because you have people like you know uh you know, all the modern philosophers, like, you know, I guess I could say, like, you know, Kant and Hegel specifically trying to make these, like, perfect systems, right? Mm -hmm. And then Bataille comes along and says, like, there's always something left over, you know, there's always something, you know, that escapes categorization or that is that, like, works against, you know, whatever your perfect system is or is, like, or like, and, okay, you have a perfect system, but what did you waste to get there, I suppose? Um, so to, just in general. Well, well, just to, to deepen that a little bit, Kierkegaard is someone who was also critical of this systematization from Hegel and others. But what Kierkegaard is focused on, obviously, is the, uh, the uh, inability to really capture subjectivity in these systems 
what but that's not what the tie is saying right he's not no does he even use those divisions between subject and object or are these somewhat i think it's very it's either it's difficult to say because it's his very own project also he uh at the beginning of probably one of his more famous famous essays the sacred conspiracy he has a Kierkegaard quotation so oh okay well yeah he definitely took that as an influence um also in the you know Kierkegaard was very religious and Bataille was was religious uh in his own way which we can also explore later yeah and I do want to talk about that too because yeah um, I think um as far as subject and object would go like you can say general economy, there's these properties that all tie us together, you know, excess and expenditure. We all have to shit basically. Mm -hmm. um, and there's all, we all throw away trash, but at the same time, he, he's interested in that. But he's also interested in the very like deep um, kind of experiential involvement with uh, reality, which is why he has the whole book, uh, Inner Experience. Um, and then, so that's, that's an aspect um, in our experience, which uh, is also great, uh, kind of how, how you feel in the world. I don't want to say it's necessarily phenomenological because it's, I feel like it's beyond that and uh, on his own kind of Bataille brand. But it's well, right, he's not you know, using through Searle's method or something like that. Right, he's, right. He's, like, to speak in broad strokes, I would say it's, you know, it's, it's similar. It's, it's, it's like how, how the, the reality we interact with affects our inner life. And then you have like uh, in his writings on eroticism, like, like eroticism, not just being like, like sex, but being like the interaction between like two entities or, or two, two like animals, like sensuality in the very like philosophical definition of like, Mm -hmm. two things affecting each other and interacting and like sharing properties so that's um so that occurs in that as well um so yeah i think he and i think that's also why like i like i, I enjoy his work because it kind of defies categories in this uh in this way but he definitely like uh it's like he breaks apart ideas and leaves you space to like explore more, you know, he, he'll like show you into the the dark catacombs, you know, the seedy parts of town for you to kind of make your own adventure um, and have your own experiences. Um, so I think that's a, a scene too. I, um, do you have anything else you wanted to say about anything? Cause I was going to go on a, a little well, rant. Let's talk about the religion part of it real quick. Well, it doesn't oh, have to be real sure. quick, but I don't have a lot to say. Uh, oh, I know that, at least in Judaism, the idea of the scapegoat is very important <clears throat> in, uh, you know, before rabbinical Judaism, when sacrifice was still one of the central themes of the practice in ancient times. And the whole point of the scapegoat was supposed to be that it was a replacement for human sacrifice. Does the Thai talk about that at all? Uh, do you know? I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe it, it felt only because, and this is just my instinct, like only because maybe he felt like it was too obvious. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Or, or he, he wanted to, uh, at least maybe to other intellectuals at the time. Yeah. Uh, like he was also, you know, at the time he would probably want to look into, he was writing about, you know, sacrifices in Eastern cultures or the Aztec. Mm -hmm. He has a chapter on Islam and uh, that, or uh, I think he, he was more interested in like the, uh, traditional cultures he writes about the potlatch a lot um gift giving ceremonies um but i definitely think that that's a, a very clear a clear line um and something that's interesting and important to talk about uh with regard to the 
sociological historical study of uh, sacrifice and stuff. And I think it would also be uh, um, at least also an inroad to uh, kind of understanding the idea of uh, sacrifice because sacrifice and sacred come from like the same root word, right? Well, the whole idea is that you're sort of, well, I don't know about other cultures, but, or religions, but I mean, the practice is essentially, you know, you're supposed to kind of be transforming whatever it is you're sacrificing into something that could be part of the greater, whatever it is, right? So you burn it yeah. and then, I don't know if you want to describe it like the smoke goes up to heaven or whatever the hell you want to say about it, but it's a transmutation of like the profane into the sacred. Right. And that's also a, a, like that's, you could, that's a great summary of like another theme that kind of runs through a lot of his work is this idea of uh, sacredness. He has this work called the sacred conspiracy, which is why um, I can say he's religious um, in his own way. Um, and, and making other like different objects sacred and different sacred parts of the world or like it's kind of trying to summarize it well like like what happens if we apply that you know in different contexts I would say so like uh like taking the the taking these ideas of sacrifice and uh you know making things sacred and, and whatnot what like if we use that as a lens to to view other interactions or other like with the world or objects or relations so and but so he's saying the reason why human beings have felt so compelled to think about not just to practice sacrifice but to internalize it in this way as the creation of the sacred uh so is what he's is what he is saying there that this is how our particular species is dealing with excess and or is there what round that out a little more for me i i think that's definitely one way of dealing with it i think um but then again you know moving through the sacred and the mystical like we're we kind of jump over to this other theme of like inner experience and like you know, feelings of ecstasy in like mystical or like religious experiences is like, I don't know, it, it jump seems really quickly right there in my mind. Okay. I mean, like things he writes a, like a lot about in two different things, but I'm not sure uh, of a specific title, but that makes sense. Like, um, at least in like, under the lens of general ec economy and things like, uh, like coming, like looking through it, through the accursed chair lens then um yes but i don't want to i'm hesitant to say totally because i feel like he might he would also support you know like uh like a, okay like let's just say you have a mystical experience with like under some tree you know like that might make that um tree a particular object of like religious importance or you know, deserve reverence, but uh, not necessarily like uh, sacred in like the sacrificial way. So I feel like there's there's a lot of uh, a lot going on there. But so that know, yeah, clarify enough. Okay. Uh, well, yes. I mean, obviously, you can't you can't just say everything he already said in one sentence. Yeah, sentence, I think. But... Uh, Um, I, I agree with you. I think that's uh, that's an important point. Uh, your video dropped out. Yeah, yeah, my uh, battery's running a bit low, but we're we're still good. Okay. Um, it's for for me. What seems to be missing in what we've talked about between the uh, the excess and the sacred and this internal experience is a concept of subjectivity or the ego. And it seems like there is 
I, I would want to know more about when he is talking about mystical experiences, which ones he's actually talking about. Like, more specifically, is he talking about, like, a sort of, um, like, uh, oneness with being, or is he talking about more like uh, visits from angels, or what, what sort doubt- of thing? Well, maybe a oneness of being in a certain sense of like in the, the death and sensuality thing, like two beings coming together. But he says, uh, um, just flipping through, I think this is also another theme, uh, this idea of non-knowledge, like just utter ecstasy. Shoot, what's on the, I feel like, I don't remember which book it is. It's like the ecstasy of some saint is on the cover of one of the books, I, I think, uh. So this idea of ecstasy, I would say, uh, is tied to this, which, you know, that makes sense in a lot of, uh, you'd say, religious experience, inner experience, mystical experiences. But his other idea of that is uh, tacked on with that is this idea of anguish. Like, anguish always comes with uh, ecstasy. Let me just read a a quotation from inner experience real quick, um, which I think also sheds light on a sheds light on some of his definitions. He says, uh, well, let me see if this chapter has a name. No. Okay. So he says, I live by tangible experience and not by logical explanation. I have of the divine an experience so mad that one will laugh at me if I speak of it. I enter into a dead end. There all, possi- there all possibilities are exhausted. The possible slips away and the impossible prevails. To pace the impossible, exorbitant, indubitable when nothing is possible any longer in my eyes to have an experience of the divine it is analogous to a torment Mm. so perhaps blinding light of angels you're ecstatic but it also also hurts and i think that's i would say that if you're into the anguish and ecstasy part that that would be inner experience um as far as like subjectivity is concerned i'm 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 not sure how he would uh like it's very uh it's very first person inner experience is written um so it's like you know I'm I'm pushing off you know kind of like a me against the world uh almost like Nietzschean experience in that way like you know that kind of vibe I would say okay um, so. Like as far as like defining anything concrete, I'm I'm not sure like specifically where that would happen, but um, because it's either like way zoomed out or like so zoomed in, we're talking about how you're feeling in your own head and experiencing, you know, the world. Um, oh, also real quick, can I throw something in in there? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay, so I I was like we were talking about how we we're gonna open, and I um, the the passage where it says approaching the impossible. Um, and maybe that's, that's also a good definition of his like religious, you know, mystical divine experiences, this idea of the impossible, which is, uh, also the name of a book he wrote. He was going to write first title it the hatred of poetry, but instead he titled it the impossible because he feels like that's the only place that true like poetry can come from is the idea of the impossible, which is also semi equivalent to, uh, limit experiences when you're just like, in any experience, you know, you could be like blackout drunk or, you know, having a divine experience or just like super depressed or whatever, like pushed to your absolute limit of, you know, the way you exist. Um, so that, that also is similar to the impossible. So there's this great uh, line that opens up the, the novel, the impossible. And that was the first full Batai book I read cover to cover. Um, and I don't, have it on hand right now but i have the opening line memorized and this is what really like sunk me into it and also uh i feel like elucidates a good theme and i think more people who are interested in Bataille's like theoretical writings and philosophy should check out the the fictional novels because i feel like you know you can read all this but when you read and kind of get a rough idea but when you read the novels you like see a character having you know this uh anguish and ecstasy and going through it you know um, which I can expand on later, but here's just this line that uh, really struck me that 
like how the book opens. It says, uh, uh, incredible nervous state, trepidation beyond words. To be this much in love is to be sick, and I love to be sick. So I think that's a interesting theme that runs through stuff too, as as a philosopher willing to willing to go there and like you know seek out the dregs of of society and experience and talk about you know sex and defecation and and all that. Yeah, and you know it reminds me of you know if he's influenced by Baudelaire or Rimbaud or you know, La Tremont, then, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you know, you're definitely going to get some of that. I don't know how you could avoid it. but um, Right, right. Uh, there seems to be a theme that we're circling around here, which is something like, you know, you could describe it as ecstasy and anguish in like a uh, two sides of the same coin way. But to me, that immediately conjures up ideas of like crisis um, or uh, rupture or any of these um, concepts you would get in something like Tikhun's writings or <clears throat> I believe, I don't know if we were recording when you said this, but you, I think you said that uh, Tikhun introduces some of their work with the tie for the yeah, he's, he's definitely present i'm not sure which ideas uh specifically like there's definitely some full-on quotations um and whatnot i just uh i don't know those are just two things that are definitely in my wheelhouse so the the ideas kind of blend together but like if you find a you know one of the larger chicken pdfs you could just like search but and and find quotations and you know, I think it's largely as a as a jumping off point. They'll say, okay, but Ty says this, and then but here's the direction we're gonna go with it. So uh, definitely an influencer like but Ty says this, but something he failed to consider was that. And I'm I'm not exactly sure what what theme it was, but having read um, and engaged with a lot of those works, they definitely you can see the influence and and definitely uh, uh, see the interaction there. So just to shift gears a little bit, um, oh, of course. we've talked a lot about philosophy and his takes on sociology and anthropology in a sense. What about politics? What about uh, either what he has said or what his impact has been on various, uh, you know, whatever political figures? Um. I guess I'll, I'll take my, uh, there's some chapters about, um, I'm not sure what his like direct involvement with like any type of political groups at the time where I don't think he stayed anywhere for long. Um, I think he was definitely, you know, knew some people and was involved in uh, various groups. Um, but hold on, I'm trying to find a chapter in Visions of Excess where he talks about the, the popular front in uh, France at the time. Okay. Um, and he said some, he said some interesting things. I, I definitely agree with. Um, uh, and I, I think there's definitely an extension there. I, I just don't think he ever in a way that like, you know, you would not imagine Nietzsche to have a final word or a final politics that ended on was very definitive. I think Bataille was the same way where, you know, there was not a final word or anything like that about particular, about like as a particular political program or anything. It was. Uh, sure. It was the reason I ask is because I've had several conversations with people, a lot of them anarchists who are uh, inspired by Bataille a lot, and I don't know what the connection is, so I'm trying to flesh that out a little bit. Whether it's oh. anarchism or not, just what, you know, it comes up in political conversations that I've had with people. Okay. Well, I'll read this little part from, uh, from this SH 
say he wrote Popular Front in the Street, and I looked into it, and there were uh, this group of uh, workers uh, in France around the time that uh, Bataille observed. And was pop, uh, perhaps like a, interacted with, I mean, I know a lot of people want to say he was in this or that group or was uh, this or that affiliation. Um, but, you know, I don't remember those right now at the time. And I think his project is like beyond, over and beyond that as well. So I'll just sure. read this little quick line and maybe that'll give us some more to talk about or shed some light on this. He says, on this point, we want to express our in a precise way. Derided humanity has already known surges of power. These chaotic but implacable power surges dominate history and are known as revolutions. On many occasions, entire populations have gone into the street and nothing has been able to resist their force. It is an incontestable fact that if men have found themselves in the street, armed in a mass uprising, carrying with them the tumult of power of the people, it has never been the consequence of a narrow and precisely defined political alliance. What drives crowds to the street is the emotion directly aroused by strike, striking events in an atmosphere of a storm. It is the contagious emotion that, from house to house, from suburb to suburb, suddenly turns a hesitating man into a frenzied being. Okay, so, okay, that right there does uh, really indicate to me a lot of, you know, where you would see like insurrectionary texts reference the tie or something like that, because there is that whole working theory and in insurrectionary anarchism that uh, you're working with something more like contagion than you are with an ideology and you're tapping into something deeper than uh, what is formally described as politics. Right. And I think that's, uh, that's also where I draw a lot of influence too. And, um, he has this great line where he says, uh, you know, uh, let's see, this is in the, the sacred conspiracy. I referenced that essay before he says, it is time to abandon the world of the civilized and its light. It is too late to be reasonable and educated, which has been led to a life without appeal. Secretly or not, it is necessary to become completely different or to cease being. So I think that's like, if you take that seriously, which I take seriously, it's like, if we're if we're pushing for a, a, a different world or a different reality, we like, we can't achieve that through recreating the same way or in the same methods. If we really want to be completely different, you know, that that is that's the way to do it. Where um, there's that idea of rupture again in there too, right? And and as far as like you know, uh, and I think that's also like looking at a you know political movements without leaders, and I think he goes into that a little bit more uh, in the Popular Front essay. Um, you know, and I, I think that was yeah that he was the first quotation I read. He said you know there was no specifically the plot to uh, define political alliance. And then I think he talked about like specific leaders at the time, which I feel like, you know, that's a, a whole nother kind of conversation, you know, the, the petite cult leaders and the, you know, the, the micro political celebrities that crop up, you know, which I'm sure happened, uh, you know, in the, in the early 20th century in France, just as they do today. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, I, I find the, the theme like, Jordan Peterson or someone. Yeah, yeah. Or even on a smaller level, like, you know, the the popular person in a certain town who everyone, you know, mm -hmm. kind of uh, simps to them or likes all their tastes. Or even on the internet, you know, what internet micro-celebrity has the best political taste, you know, who's going to, you know, whose taste is going to dominate uh, certain milieus around. All right. And, uh, Here's the question that okay. popped into my head. Headlessness. We're talking a lot right now about heads. And we briefly touched on the symbol for the acetone group. I'm just going to call it. Uh, so what is this idea of headlessness? How does it fit into um, his writing? And does it relate at all to anything you just said? about these headless groups 
that uh, I would. You know, I would say so. That's how I, I, that's how I interpret it. Um, I'll just read a passage from State Conspiracy real quick uh, a little bit later. On the, it's actually the passage in the book under the the big Ossifal symbol. <laughs> okay. Um, which I, I actually just for transparency purposes do have that as a tattoo somewhere. Anyway, so I, I take this very seriously. So he says, uh, human life is exhausted from serving as the head of or the reason for the universe. To the extent that it becomes this head and this reason, to the extent that it becomes necessary to the universe, it accepts servitude. If it is not free, existence becomes empty or neutral. And if it is free, it is in play. The earth, as long as it only gave rise to cataclysms, trees, and birds, was a free universe. The fascination of freedom was tarnished when the earth produced a being who demanded necessity as a law above the universe. Man, however, has remained free not to respond to any necessity. He is free to resemble everything that is not himself in the universe. He can set aside the thought that it is he or God who keeps the rest of things from being absurd. So just for me, the, the theme of headlessness does, you know, in a political fashion, like, you know, of course we don't want a, uh, leaders or, or even, you know, micro celebrities, you know, giving us servitude, but then even on a personal level, like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I do have to like abandon, um, rationality to live the, you know, the most fulfilled or abandon reason to live a fulfilled and, and life filled with, with ecstasy and so on. And that, that, I feel like that also, you know, the idea of headlessness touches on, this, uh, his other work about non-knowledge, um, which the book is called The Unfinished System of Non-Knowledge, and we can dive into that at some point if you ever want. No, just to get into that now, because that's, yeah, it's really interesting. Sorry, battery's uh, dwindling a little bit. So, yeah, that's, and okay. uh, even in this well, book. We'll, we'll just, uh, we'll give it like, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 more minutes and then call it. Okay. You got that in here? Of course. Yeah, okay. yeah, we can always come back to stuff um so just another thing on on uh political things that i feel like are worth mentioning um uh in blue of noon it's this book that takes place just pre-world war ii in france and uh you know everyone reads that because they fuck in a graveyard at some point at the end i it's not a spoiler that's literally the reason you read that book i've confirmed it with other people who've read it uh it's like yeah they, they fuck in the graveyard but um in terms of like political things, like there's this whole kind of middle part where they're talking about, uh, you know, there's this big street battle and, you know, the workers are going to go to the weapons storage place or siege the Bastille or something, or maybe it's not exactly the Bastille. Anyway. No, I think, it, no, I think that was, yeah. Okay. But uh, the main character in the story is off like dealing with romantic troubles and like, you know, torn between two women and like you know moping in a hotel room and and things like that so i feel i feel like that's uh that's kind of a a trope i i i associate with the, the political implications where it's like yeah there'll be uh there'll be street fighting and an insurrection going on in the streets people going to going after the weapons factory and whatnot or but then somebody's gonna be you know still trying to get frisky in the hotel room or, you know, which who's to say, which is more important if that's your life right now. Like, I think there's a line where he's like, I wanted to, the main character in the book is says like, I wanted to be out with the rioters, but I was just too, too busy dealing with this other shit. I and like I it. Formed yeah. Two different uh, women and the drama that happens there. Um, okay. So this idea of non-knowledge, which I don't want to say it's necessarily equivalent, but um non-knowledge is an ecstasy non-knowledge is in the impossible which is ecstasy which is a limit experience which is this like religious experience which is uh all this um and actually i was i don't know when i was reading the non-knowledge book i wasn't that impressed i feel like it's a little bit more dry um possibly just because there's like transcripts of lectures and stuff in there but when i went back to it it had a lot i had a lot more underlined than i thought so um, 
sorry, I just pulled this uh, chapter called The Absence of God, which is another, like, interesting thing, like, taking on this, like, Nietzschean tradition, like, okay, you know, if Nietzsche were to say God is dead, where would uh, Bataille go with that? Um, it's like, you know, God doesn't have the master, but I would say, like, okay, even our own head, even reason shouldn't be uh, our master, I would say. Um, so do you have anything you want to say or any questions? I'm kind of just flipping through trying to... Oh, you know, I actually... See where I'm at. I don't. I don't. But okay. that's okay. Uh, there's The dead air has been at a minimum, so I think people can handle it. Okay, I found my definition of non-knowledge um, in the book. He says, to specify what I mean by non-knowledge, and then he goes, that which results from every proposition when we are looking to go to the fundamental depth of its content and which makes us uneasy. Oh, mm -hmm. and then on the next page over, I have this other underlying quotation where he says, only silence is able to express what we have to say, which, uh, I feel like it's an interesting uh, tie in to the writing from Sikun called uh, Silence and Beyond, which is a, a great piece about uh, the silent protest that was in response to uh, two prisoners which were killed in prison by the guards in Italy. And just kind of how that paradigm shifted everything, you know, this idea of like, well, what are they demanding? It's like, okay, but that's not the point. You know what I mean? Confrontations with the state. Uh, would do better to not have specific demands or specific programs, which, which I believe, and I feel like we're kind yeah, of it's a, drawing from here. That's an idea that gained huge traction for uh, what at least a decade, if not more, mm -hmm. in anarchist circles. <clears throat> exactly. Um, also, he would say there's, you know, non-knowledge in, in laughter, too. Like, when you burst out laughing, like, how, how much can you be thinking when you're you're, you know, in the middle of laughing really hard. That would be another, like, ecstatic sort of, like, limit experience um, <clears throat> as well. He has, he has a chapter in one of his books that's just called Nietzsche's Laughter for tracing, like, kind of a, the Nietzschean tradition through there. I haven't flipped through as much as the Nietzsche book, but... Um, what is the one you're looking at right now called again? Oh, I'm looking at uh, the unfinished system of non-knowledge. Okay. Kendall translation, probably the only one. That but, sounds really, yeah. I would it was good. I read it a little bit. Yeah, like I said, a lot of his themes are like, you know, in and out. So, like, I, I read this idea of non-knowledge referenced a lot more in all the other books. So I was like, okay, I have to get the whole book on it, which is <laughs> interesting. It also has uh, this interview with... Uh, I think it's an interview. It just kind of jumps in in the middle of the chapter. I think, yeah, I think a lot of it's like transcripts of lectures, but he has this interview with, which features uh, uh, Jean Hippolyte. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Hippolyte. He was a uh, Hegel. Alien. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was interesting. Oh, and it looks like Sartre shows up in there too. I'm just flipping through. Yeah, I think Sartre learned a lot of his Hegel from Hippolyte or Hippolyte. Yeah. So I think that was, uh, I don't actually, I don't think I read this chapter just because I was kind of getting toward more of the other stuff and he'll, he'll speak very poetically, like kind of in the end. And that's, that's another, uh, interesting thing. Oh, another interesting line on the, uh, uh, acephalic, uh, theme is there's this line in blue of noon where the main character is just distraught and he's like, the only talent I had was for losing my head, which, um, you know, I don't, I don't like, maybe it's just a super saturated, you know, joke about, you know, a cephalic type stuff, or it was just like, that's what you say when you're, you know, distraught and dealing with a bunch of drama in your life. But that's, uh, that, that's another like theme. And that was, that would be my little joke about, uh, um, the theme of uh, headlessness weaving through all of his work. Um, he also has this uh, chapter uh, called Non-Knowledge and Rebellion from 1952. 
Let me see if I can find any bangers from this. Hold on. Uh, Look at that one real quick. I think that's when Camus published The Rebel, but I'm not sure. Okay. So, um, just to, oh, yeah, uh, I... No, nope. uh, yeah, 1951. Okay. So that right. might have been, yeah, conversational. Go on, go on. Um, he says, I think that knowledge enslaves us, that at the base of all knowledge, there's a servility, the exception of a way of life, wherein each moment has meaning only in relation to another, to another or others that will follow it. Um, Anyway, so I think that's uh, my particular like interest in this. Yeah, in, in Bataille, like scholarship, I would say, was like where where we can apply these ideas um, outside of that. And I think like in our political context, that's what uh, that, that those are important questions. Um, like like this idea of you know what does drive people into the street? It's it's nothing like reasonable um, reasonable or rational, you know um as much as everyone wants to like kind of dissect the uh, actions and, and different events later i feel like the way yeah, that crop up it's it's all most of that is retroactive narrative right that, right I think yeah that's, because I when like you're involved like, in this shit you know that like half the people at least have no idea why they're even there and then you know whoever's going to write something about it is going to find like one or two people that could say something coherent about what just happened. But I've never been to any kind of protest or riot or anything where the majority has been uh, some sort of conscious agents of any kind of agenda. Right, right. And I think that's, uh, and he also kind of touches on the concept of like violence a little bit and how that interacts with reason a little bit later in in this, the non-knowledge book but I, I yeah so in talking about like where's places we can apply this is like the theme of you know uh the acephalic you know without leaders without a head even your own head you know like maybe that's that's what we have to embrace to live the type of life we want or uh you know this idea of anguish and ecstasy you know like what is what is better for your life you know even, like are you going to go to the uh, envelope stuffing party to get people to join your political cause or are you going to go to the rave um and i've written about uh raves in other places it's not necessarily you know that liberatory anyway <laughs> um well. or or uh you know maybe we should just be pursuing you know sensual contact with everyone or, or uh, meanwhile meanwhile being haunted by this idea of violence and death and you know the excesses of uh, of existence and I think that's another thing too this, this idea of death that's very prominent which I feel like um, you know other philosophers would write about but not in the same way um, he also thought death was like kind of a talked about the idea of expenditure too because like you know dead bodies are just like so shit of human life they're the waste like there's uh lots of parts where he talks about you know um being confronted with a body and he you know that's also in a conversation with like totem and taboo that freud wrote and uh you know the first taboos in societies, I think, according to Bataille, were, like, taboos about, like, interacting with the dead and, and so on. Um, so that that's another thing, too. I think that's interesting. Also, this idea of, uh, I think he writes about it in Internet Experience, something um, that I took note of. He specifically wrote against, like, aesthesis and asceticism as, like, a, I guess this ties it back to kind of our religious conversation as a, a way to get closer to divinity, you know? He would say, like, Actually, I, I don't think this is in Bataille anywhere, but he would say, like, and maybe I just made it up, but he'd say, like, you know, we find divinity in the excess, you know, like well, when you're blackout drunk screaming at the sky or something, you know. Well, 
or, uh, you know, on your, you know, night walk home and you're all fucked up and you're just like moved to tears, like for some reason, or like uh, some of his books also do have like kind of poems at the end. And it's not like a, a typical poetry. It's almost like, like the auto poesis, like kind mm-hmm. of a uh, stream of consciousness type thought thing. And a lot of those, I would characterize that as like something, you know, a drunk mumbles to themselves, you know, on their walk home when they're suddenly struck with the entirety of their existence, you know, before the void or something. So that's, uh, that's another thing too. And I think like a lot of, uh, things I would disagree with and I guess different, uh, political things would be this like promotion of, you know, aesthetic ideals, you know, you have to fall in a very specific line, you know, you can't enjoy things in excess, you know, you have to be this good person. And, I think and just like, to, um, just to make sure everyone knows what you're saying, you're saying ascetic, like, uh, like a monk. You're not saying yes, aesthetic, yes. like a artist. Right, right. Okay, that's I heard you wrong the first time. That's why I'm. Oh, that's yeah, why I'm yeah. repeating it. Yeah, a, <clears throat> a thesis. He actually uses the word ascesis. There's a paragraph that says against ascesis because he doesn't think that. Because that's another way that, like, that people, uh, you know like the Agoris and stuff achieves this kind of a uh, divine thing. And he, he probably recognized that like, yeah, that's valid for them. But for my purposes, that's not the interaction with the divine that I would have. And and when we kind of tie in the whole idea of anguish and ecstasy and, and whatnot, like you're not going to like his sense was like, you're not going to achieve ecstasy and denying yourself thing. Um, or, or if you do, it's, it's a, it's a failed project, but you'll achieve, you know, ecstatic situations when you, you do pursue life to the limit and do pursue, uh, uh, I would, the furthest yeah. reaches and, and then laughter and, and parts when your, your brain just shuts off and you're just kind of purely, uh, experiencing things. And I think that was the primacy of, of his stuff. And that's, as far as like applying it to politics, I find that like really important too, because like, it seems like, um, so much of what people call politics or like engagement with things does have this sort of like angle of like self-denial or like absolutely you know, puritanism almost yeah exactly yeah. or uh you know do you go to the envelope stuffing party or do you go to the dance party you know you, where you're just gonna you you know who thaddeus russell is right yeah okay so there there's a whole like one of those whole points about, you know, American history uh, and this renegade history of the United States is about this whole aesthetic Puritan virtue that even crops up in labor politics and all over the place on the left and the right. And I but think yeah, that's, that's um, If I were to like uh, extend this to a particular, uh, you know, a particular uh, simultaneous like inclinations, I would say like, but I would, and why I like it is because it's absolutely the, the good with the bad. So, and I think that's a, a big problem with a lot of uh, particularly like liberatory politics or what people will market as that, or, you know, the spin they have is they say, they promise it's all good. They're saying all of these good things are going to happen. They never tell you about the, you know, Lost you there. Is that the end of it? All right. Well, it looks like we lost our guest, Astrid. But uh, to be fair, I was going to be wrapping things up soon anyway. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I think we'll be having Astrid back to talk about other things, too. So uh, I will put contact information or anything they would like in the show notes and uh, yeah, Uh, have a good one.